Well, we're on chapter four of The Bungee Venture by Stan McMurtry. And if you remember, at the end of the third chapter, Karen and Andy had rebuilt their dad's time machine in the hope that they could follow him back to the time, time of the dinosaurs, only this time they'd rebuilt it a little bit sturdier in the hope that when they close the door and press the button, it won't topple over and smash because when they go back in time, hopefully, we need that time machine to go with them so that they can then press the forward button and come back in time. Chapter four. <clears throat> Let's see if it worked. They heard the whine of the motor under the seat increase in volume until it became a shriek that almost burst their eardrums. The green and red lights on the panel flashed on and off at a tremendous speed and the whole machine started to buck and shake like a bull at a rodeo. They experienced a strange kind of sinking feeling deep down in their stomachs, a bit like being in a lift plunging down a lift shaft. Suddenly, the, the little panel of glass that they were looking through into the garage went black. Andy turned to Karen, whose face was lit up by the green and red lights from the panel. Oh, it looks like the light bulb in the garage must have blown, he shouted above the din. Doesn't matter, she yelled back. We can still see. Just then, the violent lurching of the machine started to slow down and so too did the flashing bulbs. Below the seat, the engine started to splutter and choke. The children stared at each other anxiously. It was just like being in a car that was running out of petrol. The machine gave three violent lurches, then stopped completely. The lights went out on the panel and they were left in complete darkness. Well, that's a fat lot of good, said Karen from the blackness. I told you we hadn't checked the machine enough. Oh, it's probably only a fuse gone or something, said Andy. Oh, let's face it, said Karen. We'll never be able to find Daddy. We've made the machine all wrong. There must be some bit that we've forgotten to put on. Don't give in, said Andy. Like I said, I bet it's only a fuse or a wire that's become disconnected. I'll get out. I'll have a look at the electrical circuit. I won't be a tick. So he undid the seatbelt. He removed the earplugs opened the door and walked straight into a tree. Karen heard the thump and then a yell as Andy fell. She grabbed the torch from the basket and pointed the beam of light through the open door. These are great sketches, aren't they? Through the open door of the time machine. She gave a cry of astonishment because just outside the door, where minutes before had been their garage, was now the most enormous tree she had ever seen. Andy appeared in the doorway, tenderly rubbing his bruised forehead. Where did that come from? said Karen, pointing at a tree with a trembling finger. Andy looked up at the great red-coloured tree trunk in amazement. He reached out and he touched it. The bark was extremely soft and fibrous, like the bearded part of a coconut. He pulled a piece off and crumbled it between his fingers. He turned round to Karen again. His eyes were like saucers in the torchlight. I think we're here, he whispered. Here? The, the machine worked. We're, we're here! Karen climbed out of the machine. They were standing knee-deep in wet grass. The ground felt very soft and spongy and a few drips of water fell down on them from somewhere above their heads. She walked carefully around the tree, closely followed by Andy, who, with an unexpected show of affection, <laughs> suddenly took his sister's hand and held on to it tightly. A little bit scared. The tree was really huge. It must easily have been as big around the base as their house at home. Karen held the torch at arm's length. 
the beam flickered across the dark, looming shapes of many more huge trees, and the vegetation was thick and luxurious. Large, strangely shaped green leaves glistened wetly all around, and here and there flashes of brilliant colour were picked out by the torch beam. Huge flowers hung bell-like from thick tangled stems that twisted like bindweed around, that's a twisty plant, around the great gnarled tree trunks and from every quarter there came the steady drip, drip sound of water falling from the branches onto the marshy grass. The children stared out into the eerie stillness. They both felt the cold prickle of fear that comes when faced with the unknown. It was so quiet. The woods and the forests of the 20th century were always so full of life. It was only last summer that they'd camped for a week in the new forest with their mum and dad and had been woken at midnight to the sound of screeching owl. They'd lain fuzzy with sleep in their little blue tent, listening to the noises of the night, the scurrying and scampering and scratching and calling of countless nocturnal creatures, all fresh from sleep and ready to spend an, until the dawn hunting or being hunted. But here, it was different. Not a sound came from this primeval forest, save for the soft plop of water onto wet, warm ground, or the faint, excited noise of their own breathing. Suddenly, both children stiffened with fear. Far away, and almost so quietly that it was easy to dismiss as just imagination, there came a sound. They listened intently, gripping each other's hands tightly. Yeah, there it was again. Only slightly louder this time, a soft rustling, followed by a dull thud. It got louder. Something was coming their way, only the rustling was now changing into a louder and more frightening crashing sound. A sound of bushes being torn out by the roots and of trees creaking and crashing and splintering. And worst of all, a grunting, snarling noise that was deep and resonant and shook the whole forest until the tree trunks trembled and the drips of water which fell from the branches became more like a short, sharp, torrential downpour. Well, with one accord, the children turned and fled back into the time machine. They slammed the door behind them. They sat huddled together, trembling with fear on the wooden seat. The noise was deafening. All around, they could hear the creaking and snapping and crashing of trees. It was deafening. The ground trembled and a great rumbling, grunting and roaring, which sounded like a thousand express trains rushing through a tunnel made their tinny little time machine rattle and threaten to shake itself to pieces. Something heavy fell against the side of the time machine. The time machine lurched over at an impossible angle, but didn't quite fall over. Let's get out of here, yelled Karen and started frantically pressing buttons and and pushing levers. Wait, wait! Andy grabbed her arm. She struggled against him. Let me go, she screamed. We'll get killed. But Andy put his arms across the panel of switches so that she couldn't get to them. Listen, he bellowed. It's going away. Karen stopped struggling and listening. Sure enough, the crashing sound noise was now going away from them. Whatever it was must have just passed within a metre of them from where they were sitting. They stayed very still, listening intently. Gradually the noise faded off into the distance and then silence. Phew! What on earth was that, said Andy, slumping back on his seat. I don't know, but it must have been enormous, said Karen. Oh, come on, let's go back home. I don't like it here. We're not going home until we've found you, our dad, said Andy firmly. We've been working for the last four months on this and we are not giving up now. He leant forward, readjusted the levers and dials back to the position that they'd been in before his sister's panic. Oh, you old silly, he said warmly. If you'd carried on fiddling with all those instruments, goodness knows where we would have ended up. Karen grinned sheepishly. 
and pushed the hair back out of her eyes. I'm sorry, she said, and then, do you think we should stay where we are in the machine until it becomes light? Good idea, said Andy, it would be the safest. So they made themselves as comfortable as possible on the hard wooden bench. The machine was still tipped crazily over at a steep angle and so it was extremely difficult to sit without one of them sliding down and squashing the other. But they managed. And gradually the time slipped by and the inky blackness that enveloped them dissolved into the soft greyness of early morning. The children tumbled out of the time machine onto the wet grass and gazed with renewed wonder at their surroundings. In the torchlight of the previous night, there'd been a solid, impenetrable, you can't see through it, funny forest. The scene now was one of complete devastation. The forest was still there, of course, but now a great path had been forced through the trees from left to right and as far as the eye could see. Huge trees had been torn from the earth and scattered like dandelions on all sides. The tree that they'd been standing beside last night now lay on its side. Its gigantic roots were still clinging to a great ball of earth like a, a giant doll that wouldn't stand up again. A big branch had fallen on top of the time machine and pinned it against the trunk of the tree. Andy immediately started to pull and heave at the branch. It toppled to one side with a crash. He then dropped down onto his hands and knees and began to peer at the ground intently. What on earth are you doing, said Karen. Help me, said Andy. The machine has pushed at least a metre or two from its original position by the branch. It's important that we put it in exactly the same position that the time machine landed in last night. What difference does it make, said Karen. It makes a lot of difference, said Andy, his nose still hovering above the ground. If we get into the machine where it is now, when it's time to go home, we might end up halfway through our garage wall. Ugh, said Karen. Nasty. Exactly, said Andy. Eventually they found four indentations in the marshy ground made by the legs of the heavy tyre machine and with much pushing and shoving... They, oh, my fingers don't work. They managed to get the machine back into its original position. They, they then carefully covered it with small branches and bits of bracken until it was completely hidden from view. This done, they picked up the shopping basket with the food in it, sat down a tree root and ate a hearty breakfast. Surprisingly, the tea in the flask was still warm and the ham sandwiches were delicious. Which way shall we go, said Andy, pointing at the tree-strewn path. Well, I reckon we ought to go in the opposite direction to the monster or whatever it was that made that path, said Karen. I don't want to meet him again. Nor me, said Andy. He stood up, brushed the crumbs off his trousers. Are you ready? Karen held out her hand and he pulled her to her feet. She glanced up and down the lane that was, had been formed through the forest, swallowed hard and said, I'm ready. Right, said Andy, let's go and find Dad. He lifted the basket and they started off down the path, picking their way between the uprooted trees. Now, what makes you think that this might be a straightforward, let's go and get Dad and bring him back? Well, if it was straightforward, we wouldn't have all those pages to read. There are lots, there are plenty of adventures about to begin. So stick with it. We're already up to the start of chapter five and that's page 33. And if you've been listening from the start, you'll know that I said that on page 35, we meet one of my all time favorite characters that you will never heard of before. So watch this space. See you soon. Happy listening. Bye.